when I sat down to write this book, I knew that, that I sort of wanted to explore those bonds that exist between women, especially when they're sort of picking up the pieces of, you know, some of them have these failed relationships or really complicated, um, you know, family dynamics of their own. And I, I wanted to explore how women sort of pick up the pieces and support each other and the complexity that also exists sometimes in those, in those bonds. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where today's guest is Gabrielle Garcia, and we are going to be talking about her debut novel of Women and Salt, which is a Good Morning America book club selection and a Book Reporter Betson selection. I have been looking forward to this conversation. I absolutely love this book because it's so different from a lot of the other books that I've read. So Gabrielle, welcome. And let's start by you telling us a little bit about Of Women and Salt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's this, Of Women and Salt. Um, it's, it's basically a, it takes a place across five different generations, um, but I wouldn't call it like a historical saga. Like there's basically two parts that kind of um, take place in a more distant past, but mostly it takes place in contemporary times. And it follows these two families. One of them is a Cuban, Cuban American family um, living in Florida. And the other family is a neighbor. Um, and her daughter who immigrated from El Salvador. Um, and the book sort of takes place across all of these different time periods, all of these different generations. So some of it takes place in Cuba, some of it takes place in Mexico, um, in a detention center in Texas. And at its heart, it's really these, um, these relationships between mothers and daughters and the secrets and the stories that are passed on um, and how these lives sort of intersect in unexpected ways. And that's what makes it so special is because you're looking at these people in so many different ways. The book opens with this very short prologue with Carmen, one of the, a mother, imploring her daughter, Jeanette, to tell her if she wants to live. And at that moment, readers really don't know what's happening here, but it sets up the fact that Carmen has set, kept some secrets from Jeanette. And the secrets are really a huge part of this book. With the prologue, was it your goal to get us involved with these characters really quickly and sort of set the tone of, it's all not gonna be what you see. There's a lot behind here. Yeah, I wanted to sort of anchor the book in that sort of um, you know, contemporary story or more contemporary times. And you're right, like a lot of the book is about these secrets, these sort of untold stories that exist. Um, and then, you know, right after that part, you're sort of swept back many generations back. But I did want to start from that place um, so that, you know, later on you're reading this part in, you know, this historical chapter and everything, and you sort of start to be able to place everything in context as you continue to read the book. Um, because so much of it is about stories, like I said, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, um, the stories others tell us about ourselves, and the stories that we don't know, but that shape us just just as much, you know. Um, one of the sort of phrases that comes up a lot in the book is, we are force. And that's in a letter that Victor Hugo um, writes to cigar workers. You sort of see that in one of the early chapters, but kind of what I was thinking about are all these historical forces, these storytelling forces um, mm -hmm. that shape these characters, whether, whether they know it or not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, the book then shifts immediately to 1866, and I was kind of thrown. I'm like, wait a second now, what's happening here? When Maria Isabel, the matriarch of the family, of one side of the family, is working as a cigar roller, and she's the only woman in the room. So you immediately see that she's, you know, a little bit like out there of, I'm just going to do something for my family. This is a great way to earn money. All the other workers are men, which is another theme in the book, women working to be strong and on their own. And the art of rolling cigars is something you really take readers into. And were, did you ever spend time in one of those factories? Did you ever see people rolling tobacco? I have seen people rolling tobacco and I've briefly seen some of the factories. Um, but you know, my family was always really into cigars. My father really liked smoking cigars. And I remember seeing some of these growing up, um, you know, these cigars called like Romeo y Julietas and Monte Cristos. But I never knew the history behind some of those names, which are actually the names of books that cigar factory workers were read. Um, there's this practice of lectors who sort of read 
books and newspapers and things to um, tobacco workers as they're rolling, which is something that continues to this day. Um, but yeah, I remember learning that those names actually came from books that were really popular in, in the tobacco factories. And I was so um, fascinated by that sort of interplay between the literary culture at the time and workers and the political movements that were happening. Um, so, you know, I became really interested in, in researching that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was something I didn't know either. My husband loves cigars. Like him, the golf course means a cigar. I'm just like, which I just like go smoke them there. If he's outside, it's like you have to go downwind of me and whatever. But I didn't know any of that either. So now I'm going to go look at the, the names on some of the cigars and just see you know, what else they could be based on. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. So throughout Women in Salt, you bring up stories of five women and they're each given chapters. We've already met Maria, but tell us a little bit about the other four women. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about Carmen and Jeanette, but who are these, who are these women that we're gonna encounter? Yeah, so Jeanette is sort of um, a character that comes up a lot throughout the book, sort of the, the center of the book. And, you know, sh you see her at different points in her life. She's um, the daughter of Cuban immigrants living in Miami. Um, you see her in her younger sort of teenage years and then later on in her life. And she she's struggling with a lot of things. She's struggling with a um, really toxic relationship. She starts to descend into addiction. And she also has a really complicated relationship with her mother. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of silences between them, a lot of things they don't know about each other that sort of come up later on in the book, but that cause a real rift between them. Um, and, you know, Carmen, again, she's the mother of Jeanette and she, you know, so much of her life and her choices are dictated by these things from her past that she hasn't fully processed. Um, you know, she has a, a, she stopped talking to her own mother and you sort of have a chapter where you meet Dolores, who's her mother, and you understand some of her historical context mm -hmm. and why that um, why that fissure occurred with, with Carmen and Dolores. Um, and again, some of, you know, some of those stories that, that weren't passed on. Um, and then you also meet Gloria and Anna, who are the neighbors. Um, and Gloria, um, immigrated to the U.S. from El Salvador and her daughter, you meet her when she's, um, I think about seven years old. Um, and then you meet her a little bit later on um, in Mexico where they're living at, at that time. And um, yeah, Gloria is someone who's sort of dealing with um, the aftermath of a lot of, you know, both personal and political violence mm -hmm. and, um, you know, situating her life within, within everything else that's happening. You know, they end up in a in a detention center in Texas. So that's sort of where you first hear Gloria's voice. Mm -hmm. And what I really loved is everything's gonna to come together. There's this brilliant ending where all the pieces like fall into place. It's like, like a, uh, just like the dominoes all fall, they all just fall like perfectly. And you just sit there and say, wait a second, this all completely worked. But you go back and you say, there was a hint of this before, but I didn't really know. And you knew there was a rift, but you didn't know why, but it is beautifully, tied up at the end, but it doesn't feel like it was just tied up like quickly with a bow. It's like perfectly like wrapped together in what you're doing. You know, in many of these women are living parallel lives and they trip in and out of each other's stories. And it makes it all the more special because it feels like real life. Was it challenging to try to have them intersect with each other? Was that a, like you see character, but how do they all come together? Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about structure and how I want, I knew that I didn't want to write like a sort of linear, traditional um, Western story structure that I really wanted these chapters to have the, the feel almost of like, you know, how we, how we process history, how we process memories, how we process stories we're told, you know, you get these sort of glimpses and you, you sort of start to try to like put it all into context. Um, kaleidoscopically. And I wanted there to be, you know, certain echoes, like you said, um, between chapters, certain ways. There are certain, you know, things that that are mirrored in certain chapters or um, pieces that start to make sense as you continue reading it. So I was, I was really 
uh, thinking about it that way, you know? Um, and I think, yeah, like you said, I wanted it to be sort of a book where things start to, you know, you start to see the connections as you read further, but also that you can go back and, you know, read other parts of it and, and place it in a different context. You know, I love books like that, that I like reread or I go back and suddenly see something in a different light. And so I was really interested in sort of trying to do that in my own work. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because something that you're reading, it's like, well, wait, why are they doing that? And later on you're, oh, that was what was going on. That's why she said that. That's why such and such happened. Did you have notes about all the characters like up on a wall? Like, so you knew what they looked like or did you just have it all in your head? Yeah, I, I don't really do that thing that that I think is so cool that some writers do, you know, just have like a wall full of, um, you know, every every way they're thinking about these characters. I I didn't really do that while I was writing this. I sort of, you know, I wrote a lot of it, even though the, the actual book is not chronological and shifts in time, I wrote a lot of it in order. And I think that was helpful for me because I sort of thought about what is the information that, um, you know, we need at this point, or, um, you know, who's the character that it sort of makes sense to pivot to at that point. And so that's sort of how I kept, kept track of the information. But, you know, it was definitely also just helpful to have other readers who could be like, I don't, I don't understand this yet, or like this character, you know, needs to be fleshed out more. So that that's always really helpful. You know, sometimes the early readers are catching things. I remember um, an author gave me her manuscript at one point and I said, the little boy was in the hospital at one point and I said, he's still there. And she says, oh, really? I thought I took that out. And there are things that like, as you're writing, it makes sense for a moment and then it doesn't. So yeah, having early readers is a big deal. Um, you also included a chart at the beginning that notes the order of the five generations of women at the front of the book, which I found to be really helpful. Did you decide to do that at the beginning or is that something at the copy edit stage where everybody says, maybe this would be good to have here? Um, that's something that I added, you know, after I was done with the book. Um, I, I mean, I'm always excited when I open up a book and there's, you know, a family timeline. Like, I, I love that. Um, but I also... I also sort of wanted it to set the tone for what the book was going to do. So it's, you know, it's exclusively a matrilineal mm -hmm. um, family tree of these two families. Like you only see the women and that sort of mirrors the way the book just centers only the women's um, stories. And there, you know, there are characters who are not women, but they're always sort of at the periphery. Like I really wanted the entire book to be in women's voices and like really center um, the women. So that's, you know, I think it's functioning as sort of both kind of setting the tone for what's to come, but I think it also might be helpful as you're reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was reading, I was looking back and I was like, wait, who is that? Where do they come in? Because you get so involved in their story, but you still want to see where they place and what's going on. Was there one character that was easier to write than the other that when you sat down and go, oh, this one, this is the easy chapter, or are they all stumblers? Yeah, I feel like, you know, I wish there was a character that came more easily. I feel like each one sort of had its own challenges because they're all really, you know, complicated, complex, flawed characters, you know, who sometimes um, do things or behave in ways that are really differently than I might behave in that way or, you know, make choices that I wouldn't necessarily make. So all of it sort of required me kind of really trying to think honestly about who these characters were and what made sense to them. Um, and then I really wanted every voice to feel really different, mm -hmm. you know? Um, every character just has a very distinct style of writing and a very distinct voice. And so, you know, that was a challenge too, just to stay true to the actual character voice and not my own like authorial intrusion, you know? Mm -hmm. I have to say that for a debut novel, it's so accomplished because you actually felt each of the characters and there are these shifts in tone and voice and attitude of what's coming across on the page. And it completely worked because I never was trying to guess which character it was. The each one was completely drawn. It's not like, well, wait a second. She's got some of the characteristics of they were like perfectly there on the page. Um, there's a lot here about mothers and daughters and their relationships. And I think I read somewhere that you were raised by a single mom and you grew up with many women being a part of your life. Did that influence your wanting to explore the mother-daughter relationships? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, going back to what I was saying about the book sort of centering women and the matrilineal um, family trees, I, 
I grew up surrounded by women. Like you said, I was raised by um, a single mother and she had a sister. My grandmother had all sisters. Um, you know, my mother had also a lot of friends who were women who were very much um, involved in my life when I was growing up. And, you know, I just, I never felt a lack in that, you know, I, I felt um, like my life was just really enriched by the sort of community that I was in growing up, um, surrounded by women. And so I think when I, when I sat down to write this book, I knew that, that I sort of wanted to explore those bonds that exist um, between women, especially when they're sort of picking up the pieces of, you know, some of them have these failed relationships or really complicated, um, you know, family dynamics of their own. And I, I wanted to explore how women sort of pick up the pieces and support each other and the complexity that also exists sometimes in those, in those bonds. Yeah. Because at the same time, many of the men in their lives are really less strong, less motivated. And I felt like this made the women have to empower themselves because sometimes they've got to be sitting there saying, wait, he is never going to get this done. It's got to be on me in order to make the family survive, you know, all these kinds of things. And while men are at certain points during the culture are still the rulers of the roost. <laughs> they are all seeing, wait a second, if we go that way, the roost isn't gonna be a good place for us, for the children, for anybody. I've got to start, you know, strike out on my own. So am I right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's sort of what, what happens in a sort of heteropatriarchal society often, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, I, yeah, these women often are sort of having to just forge a life um, despite these men or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but I also wanted to sort of write against the idea that these women are like only strong or, um, you know, that this is like a painless um, way to li live a life, um, you know, because, you know, some of the women are strong in certain ways. Um, and other times they're, they're deeply affected by what's, what's happening around them and like really struggling to sort of exist in this, in this world. Um, so, you know, I wanted, I just wanted to sort of really explore the, the complexity of those relationships. Mm -hmm. It completely does. You know, but way back at the beginning, Jeanette takes in Anna, who's this little girl, I think she's about seven years old. And it's so interesting to see her in a caretaker role because usually she's the one that kind of is a mess. Like she's the one that everybody else is gonna have to take care of her. And her mother is initially, her mother Carmen is initially appalled that she did this. And she battles with her mother saying, you are an immigrant and she berates her that she cannot think about calling the authorities about Anna. Like she's saying like, this could have been you. Now, I know that you worked in the past as an organizer for those that were um, working on deportation defense work, you know, things along that line. Did those sections info, like your work influence those sections of the book? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, um, I, was, I was working as an organizer for many years, primarily doing deportation defense work and working with a lot of women who were in detention. Um, and so some of those chapters, particularly that take place in the detention center, um, I started writing some snippets of that when I was, when I was doing that work before I ever imagined um, I would write a book. But yeah, I think, you know, in terms of the of the sort of, there are all these dynamics happening in that, in that section that you're talking about, you know, there are these like generational differences in how Jeanette and her mother think. And also I think, you know, I sort of, I was writing against the idea that there is like an immigrant experience. Like I, you know, I always hear that phrase or get asked about it. And I don't, I don't think there is a immigrant experience. I think there are just so many different experiences that are based on race and class and circumstances of migration. Um, and so, you know, there's this idea that Carmen, this sort of very wealthy, privileged Cuban American um, who had this very sort of easy path to um, immigrating to the US is going to feel solidarity with um, Anna and her mother who are facing deportation and have, you know, just have a very, very different life from Carmen. Um, and so, you know, I think that section is sort of exploring some of that like tension that exists there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. And then when Gloria is being held in the t detention center, you offer a view of what it's being like to be held against will, 
without actually committing a crime, except that you want to live somewhere. That's all that she wants to do is she wants to live in the United States. And it made me think about the border situation now, which is something that's escalated so quickly over the last like, you know, for a few months. It's not that it's a new situation. It's just something that's on the news every night. And it made the book even more timely to me. And I was just, and I found that as I was reading the book, I was watching the ever ending network story that comes on about this every single evening with no solution in sight. And all I kept thinking was Gloria, who was sitting in that room and she put a face on one of the people that was in that detention center. And I think that the more that we can read in fiction about the people, because yes, you can read it in nonfiction, but also be having stories told from those people's point of view, I think is very important for a gateway to people of their understanding, because we see those people on the news, but we don't really talk to them all. We don't sit there and see, and you got us into her head. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the issue of, of timeliness or, um, you know, for me, because for, for me, I feel like I, I do and have talked to those two people who, um, are in detention or migrating to the U S or, you know, have been a part of, of communities of mine for, for a long time. And so, um, and yeah, yeah I mean, the, the section that I'm writing sort of is set in 20, 14, I believe, um, around the same time that I was working on these issues during the Obama administration. Um, and so, you know, this was this was happening before. So I'm always really interested when people say that it's timely because mm -hmm. I just started, you know, this this happened mm -hmm. before I ever even thought Trump would be president or, you know, any any of what's happened now. Um, and at that time, when I was working as an organizer, you know, the main difference was that it was so hard to get any kind of a large scale media attention on a lot of a lot of the stuff that we were working on like there was just you know that was just such an uphill um battle versus the kind of attention that you know the mainstream large you know large audience is is paying now um yeah and i think you know when i was when i was thinking about Gloria, like it's sort of, it's not even so much that she wants to live in the US, like she just wants a kind of, um, you know, a place where she can just, you know, live a life and, and pursue her life with her daughter. And so much of what she's sort of, you know, trying to leave behind is all of this um, US fueled, you know, political violence, but also personal violence and the way these two things sort of interplay with each, with, with the other, you know, um, and sort of echo, you know, everything else that's sort of happening on the U.S. side as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think when I say when, what's timely, yes, this has been going on for a much longer time than people, people think it's all new now. But, you know, for so long, our focus was on Iraq and Afghanistan. Our focus was on what was happening in South Korea, the bigger world, like the world and looking at our own border was not something we were looking at quite the same way. It was an issue. It was an issue. But it was like, oh, we've got to get Osama bin Laden. Oh, we've got to go do this, that, the other thing. And at the same time, this very near to us issue has been escalating for years. I mean, and it's, and everybody's asking, yes, like it's new. I'm saying it's timely because maybe it's time we sit there and start discussing what's really happening right in our own backyard, instead of being like, you know, caretakers of the whole world. It's like, what can we do here? You know? Yeah. And I, and I don't think those things are like not connected. You know, I think the way that the, that the U S you know, the role that the U S has played in, in, you know, the wars that you're talking about in the Middle East um, is not disconnected from the ways that U.S. policies and support of um, of you know <laughs> right wing regimes in, in Latin America and all you know all of these other things like have have sort of fueled um, what happens at at the border. Like the border is sort of the the middle story. <laughs> um, mm -hmm you know there's so much focus on the border but there's there's just there's so much happening on a, on a on a larger scale that's right. sort of right 
all of it is interconnected, you know? That's, and that's what you really have to be thinking about is like, oh, it's not just this moment of what's happening over here. It's really, there's a big global picture of what's going on here, folks. It's not just what's happening down in Texas. It's not what's happening at Arizona. It's what's happening in all those countries that we really have not paid much attention to. Like, you know, if, if, you, if you handed most people in this country a map of Central America and said, just draw where everything is on the map, they probably couldn't do it. Yet a lot of those people are walking through those countries to come to the United States. But I don't think that we are really in touch with what's going on down there. I really don't. And why, why the situation is happening, I don't think we, most of us know the whole story behind it. And I think that that's the part that's really the shame. You know, nobody just gets up in the morning and says, gee, let me leave my house, walk through Mexico to maybe get into the United States, unless there's a real reason that you felt to need to leave. And I think that that's, you know, coming up again and again, you know, not all, everything that these women do though is um, acceptable and it's very realistic. Was the writing of them in tough scenes tough for you to do? Like when you put them in tough situations? Yeah, cause I think, um, you know, like you said, sometimes these characters are, are behaving in ways that I wouldn't, you know, necessarily behave or doing things that, um, that I wouldn't do or that I would, pref you know, I, I would maybe want something else for them. Um, but I really wanted, you know, I wanted my characters to, you know, I wanted to present these characters in their full humanity, you know, mm -hmm. um, I wanted them to feel like whole people, which means, you know, flawed characters, um, complicated, you know, they're all very complicated women. And, you know, it explores a lot of mother daughter relationships, but I also wanted to write against some of the tropes that exist, you know, like a very common one is the sort of suffering, sacrificing immigrant mother. Um, and, you know, these mothers do suffer or sacrifice at, at different points, but they're also so much more than that and so much more complicated. You know, there are points where Gloria, like, dreams about not even being a mother, you know, or, you know, sort of engages with, with the complexity of that um, within herself and thinks about all of the other pieces of herself. And so, you know, I, I wanted to sort of portray these really complicated, complex women. And yeah, that was, that could be difficult sometimes going to some of those darker, more difficult places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's even, um, Jeanette saying to your mother, well, you know, you were privileged, like you were, you were an immigrant, but it was completely different when you came in and there are different, um, different classes of immigration that of people coming in. There are people that came in during the time where it was, um, a more acceptable thing to be going on than what's going on now. And, and that's what's something that I had not really thought about is, even in the Miami area, there are different times that people came in and as a result, they're perceived differently. So can you just touch on that for a little bit? Yeah, and I, you know, I think part of what happens when we sort of flatten experiences, when we talk about one immigrant experience or even when we talk about um, Latinidad as, you know, this sort of flattened concept um, is, is that you don't, you don't get into those complexities and, you know, in particular with uh, Cubans immigrating to the US, you know, up until fairly recently, there were laws in place that meant that when you came from Cuba, I think it's the only group um, for whom this was true, you're sort of on an automatic path to citizenship. And there are all of these resources um, provided to you by all these other laws that sort of make it um, a lot easier to sort of, you know, make it in, in the US. And um, and there is all of these historical differences too, even in, in groups of Cubans coming in like early on after the, the 1959 revolution, um, a lot of the, the people coming to the US were um, formerly, you know, very wealthy, mostly white, um, and were sort of coming in, um, you know, it was just a very different experience than, for example, economic migrants coming from other, other countries. And so, you know, growing up in Miami, which is a, a Latinx majority city, um, I was very aware of, of a lot of those sort of tensions and divisions that exist a lot along racial lines, along class lines, um, along generational lines sometimes, you know, even within, you know, Cuban immigrant communities. And so, you know, I wanted to write about Miami in, in that kind of way that felt, that felt honest and explored some of that complexity.
Yeah, it really did. Because I know um, I have a couple of readers that are, live in the Miami area. And we used to get together like, you know, years and years um, of going to Miami book fair together. And then we'd go out to dinner and we'd go out and chat and they'd bring me and they say, like, I want you to come meet my mother. Like, I'm going to bring you home. I want you to meet my mother. I want you to meet my nep- my son, my nephew, whatever. So you feel like you got to know the extended families as well and then hear their stories. And I always thought that that was one of the most interesting parts is hearing the history of how they left Cuba, how they came to this country, what th- what traditions they've kept, what traditions they've changed, what um, how the children feel now, and the closeness of family and how close family truly is was one of the things that I come from, from Italian background and it's close family, you know, knitting it, knit as well. And it's just those those kinds of family matters. Family is important to you, and even if there are strifes and you know what's going on, you still there's still those bonds there. And you did such a good job drawing that, that even if you are um, in so many different places, there's still family and family's at the core of everything. Yeah. And I think like, like you said, um, you know, part of what's happening in the book is you are getting all of these stories or these mythologies or these, you know, family histories, but you're, you're seeing them from a very specific perspective. And then sometimes that shifts and you see it in a very different perspective when you, you know, you I think there's one chapter, for example, where um, Jeanette travels to Cuba and she meets her cousin who lives in Cuba for the first time. And you sort of see their perspectives of each other in Cuba. You know, um, Jeanette sort of goes there with a certain expectation, um, sort of ideas of what Cuba is going to mean to her and that sort of bucks against expectation. And you know, I was, I was sort of really interested in that too. And these two characters sort of seeing each other, but not really seeing each other. And I think that's sometimes too, how, you know, family stories and mythologies work. You can look at them from all of these different perspectives and you can never fully, you know, understand the history. You can't be there, you know? Um, And so I was, I was really interested in that. Mm -hmm. You know, on my mother's side of the family, my grandfather is the only one who came from Italy. Every other member of the family stayed. And she went back at one point and I was like, did you ask why he left? Because he was the only person who didn't stay and it was, they had a successful life, they had, you know, a, they had different homes, you know, it's, it wasn't out of poverty, it wasn't out of need or whatever, what ended up happening. And we've never gotten the answer. And I think that that is, I was thinking of that as I was reading this book is probing the questions in the family of why did certain things happen? Because you even know with your own siblings, your own family, there's reasons that things happen along the way, but you just are really curious later. And I think that that's what we're peeling the, the um, outside of an onion on this book of like really what's at the heart like why did this actually happen and we things are revealed especially towards the end of the book that will just put it all together and all of a sudden you see the family for what it really is Mm -hmm. and then there's the things that you just can't ever know you know and so even sometimes there are points where as the reader like there are things that you know that the characters don't know um and I think that's that's true to life too you know like there, there are just things you, you'll never have access to or histories that you will always get through one perspective. Um, and so I wanted to explore, you know, like I said, both the stories that were told and also the ones that we will never know, but that also shape us just as much, you know? It's a little moment back there that ended up being here. So I remember my mom, when she went back, she was at the church where her father had um, gone to church. And she said, I just realized she was very emotional kneeling at that altar, which is the same place he had been and all those years ago. And it was just this very emotional experience. And I feel like you've, you've gone to Cuba, you've done many trips to Cuba. And when you go, do you see more of what the global view of your family is when you go back and do that? Um, I mean, again, I think it's, it's, it's sort of really hard to to place anything contextually. And I'm always going to be going back with, you know, the perspective of having lived my whole entire life in in the US. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's just, you can never get like the full context from all perspectives, you know. Um, But yeah, I think, you know, I, I think maybe part of my interest in sort of writing this book and in exploring all of these different perspectives is this, that sort of tension that I think is common to a lot of children of immigrants, um, sort of traveling back to these places that, that you maybe feel a very strong emotional connection to, or expect to feel a very strong emotional connection to, but that are not fully, 
yours, you know, um, and that you you can't ever understand other than in that context of, you know, being a child of immigrants and, and traveling there. And, you know, all of the complexity and the tensions that exist in that, which I explore a little bit of that too, with, you know, all these characters who are sort of outsiders in a way, like there's certainly Jeanette traveling to Cuba. There's also like a character who's like a US expat in Mexico. Um, and so, you know, you, you sort of, there, there's all these characters who are sort of outsiders coming into a place. Mm -hmm. And how they're gonna see it and what their interpretation is. There's also this rare copy of a manuscript, and we're not going to talk about what it is, you because it all layers into the story, that moves through the family and we see its origins at the tobacco factory. When it's found again, it's always interesting how it was kept secret, like through the years and what you know what happened. Was that always there? Was that little like talisman that I feel like you know it's just passed on through the generations in the book? Was that always a part of the story? Yeah, it was. And I think part of it is, you know again, that I, that I was really exploring the way that sort of stories exist and press on and what you can't recover. And so having like an actual book be, be involved felt like a sort of entryway into that. And it's, it sort of comes to mean different things to different people. You know, there's like things scribbled in the margin and you're not even sure why it was written there. And, you know, um, it means different things to different people, you know, it meant something to Maria Isabel when she encountered the book in the cigar factory in the 20th century. And then at one point, um, you know, it figures as a, as something that someone's thinking about for its like financial value as an, mm -hmm. as you know, so it, you know, it comes to mean different things and it's sort of assigned meaning based on who these characters are. Um, and how they interpret its existence, which is sort of, I think, the way that these stories sort of function. So yeah, I was I was sort of thinking about it on all those layers. All those layers, yeah. There, there were also chapter names that come in at the beginning of each chapter. Did you do those at the beginning or did those come in at the end of what you were gonna name each chapter? Because I love when authors do that because you often go back and look at the chapter name and say, where did that come from? I, I love titles, you know, <laughs> um, and I, you know, I write a lot of short stories in addition to the novel and I also write poetry. And so, so I'm often thinking about titles and the work that titles do in like shorter work. And so I, you know, I, I kind of really wanted to do that with, with my novel. Um, and I love when I read novels that have chapter titles. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I knew early on that I wanted Mm -hmm. You know, that and the, you know, and then beginning the, uh, what is it, the family tree at the beginning, both work so well for me. But, you know, you also have me going back, I've been doing this more, it was going back and reading the prologue later on to see how it all ties through the story. Because I feel like authors think really hard about the prologue and the reader just goes through it and goes, okay, let me read the book. And then all of a sudden, when you go back and reread it, it's almost at the end, I like them to say, and now go back and read the prologue and see, <laughs> you know, it's like a little tip here, folks, you know, what to do. Your book is a really brisk read. Um, it, I think it came in about 200 pages, which these days is kind of unheard of to have something tight. Everything is bloated. Um, you've written a lot of poetry. Did that give you some like texture on writing sparingly? Like I can do this. I don't need extra words, extra whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think I think poetry has informed so much of how I think about fiction. Like, um, and it's just been one of the, you know, reading a lot of poetry has been so helpful to thinking about how I write fiction. Um, and it certainly came comes in in the way that I think about sentences and voice and sound and how that shifts throughout the book. Um, and yeah, maybe, you know, I hadn't really thought about how, how that influenced kind of how I thought about this structurally and sort of in these like small chapters. Um, but it's, it's possible, you know, like I, I, I think often when I'm thinking about poetry, I'm thinking about both the words that are there and also what exists in the white space mm -hmm. um, and, in, and in those spaces of unknowing, which is certainly kind of how I was thinking about this book. Like there, there are all these places where you sort of are filling in your own information or where there's just a space of unknowing and that's like, okay, you know, um, and that has like its own kind of power. And so I think maybe some of that is, is informed by by poetry, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I know you went to Fordham, as did three of us on our staff here at Book Reporter. What did you study when you were in the Bronx? 
Yeah, I loved, loved my time at Fordham. Um, so I did not study creative writing or ever even take a creative writing workshop until my MFA. Um, I studied, I double majored. I studied sociology and I studied um, communication and media studies with a focus on radio and television. So I was, I had so many jobs when I, when I graduated college, but I worked in the music industry for a little bit. Um, and then I worked for magazines and everything before I sort of went into organizing. Mm -hmm. So this is all this different background. And it, it, it's really interesting to be at Fordham, which is like this like microcosm place on campus in the middle of the Bronx. And like you, you, you get there and there's this, this vibe that comes off the campus. It's a community, it's all this kind of thing. And you walk out and you're in a big city. And it's the way that the place is kind of transformed. And people used to say, oh, I'm so worried about my children going to school in the Bronx. I said, really, truly, it's completely different. Like being in the school there, it was this little island oasis. But by the same token, I loved going out to the neighborhoods. I loved going up to Arthur Avenue. I loved being able to explore, even though when I was there, it wasn't the safest place to be running around, but it was just, it was this very, very special type place and time. So. Yeah, I loved, I loved Fordham and I lived, um, off campus for a long time, like in, in that area of the mm -hmm. Bronx. Um, but I think, you know, I think what exists with, with Fordham is what exists with a lot of universities that are, um, you know, you have the university population that is really different from the population in the community. And it just exists with this kind of gated institution with, within a community, which, you know, could be un uncomfortable for me at times. And, and there was a, a really sort of strange dynamic in that. Um, but I, I loved, you know, I loved living off campus and I loved sort of trying to find these pockets of, of community there. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that for the first year I lived at school, I lived off campus and they had, um, there was a building that was subsidized housing and they put us in the building where there was subsidized housing. And for me, it was a very like valued experience because there were all, it wasn't just a bunch of college kids in the building. It's a bunch of families. It was a bunch of women raising their children. And it was a bunch of young people trying to get started. And I'll never forget, I went down the laundry room one time and I like swore. And this little kid was like, mm, you said a bad word. And I was just there like, it was like you were being in real life as opposed to what the artificial life is what happens when you're usually on a campus it's like mm -hmm. oh this is this little bubble you're living in and i feel like we were living outside the bubble and it was a really good experience as a result i feel like you, you, your horizon definitely got widened by doing that so i love the cover was this always the cover or was there lots of playing around to get to this Let's see if I pick it up. i have my galley here still yeah um, I, I also love the cover and we did go through um, a few different options. And then I think I saw that one and I just felt so, so, um, you know, I just felt like so seen by that artwork, like in the way that it connected to what the book is. Um, and actually the, the cover artist, cover designer is um, this, this young woman named Adalis Martinez who actually passed away like not shortly after. Mm -hmm um designing the cover and she was super young in her early 20s and so I I think I you know the cover just holds a really really special place um in my heart for me and I just I just yeah it, it was such a such a gift and I felt so it was just like the perfect cover when I this, saw it. it really is it really truly is was this always the title or did you play around with that it it was mostly, I mean, I think early, early on, I sort of wrote a bunch of different, different things down and then settled on this, but it, it never changed throughout like the publication process or anything like that. I always, it was always that. Mm -hmm. When I was submitted, that was that, you know, it's just, you yeah. know, just a perfect, perfect title. Um, Frankie Corzo does a great job of narrating the audio book. Did you have a hand in selecting her to do that? I did. I heard, um, you know, clips from several different voice, voice actors and, it was really important for me in a book that has, you know, all of these different characters and there's some times where there is Spanish that the, that the accents felt correct to me, you know, like that's always a, a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> like when, you know, you have a character who's supposed to be Cuban and then the Spanish is in like a Peruvian accent or whatever, you know, so I, I went through so many different clips, you know, before I felt like there was someone who could, um, 
embody some of these different accents and in a way that felt believable and mm -hmm. realistic. And so I, I was really happy with how, how it turned out. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, it's truly well done. And I can see where that kind of perfection to try to get that part correct, because you're going to have the audio experience. It's this theatrical kind of experience. You just want to make sure it's also accurate of this is the way you would have heard those words. Now, I think the book is dedicated to your grandmother. Is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what made you uh, tell us a little bit about her and how does she about the, you know, the uh, reason that you did that? Is she a big influence yeah, so, on you? So, you know, it's a book that sort of <laughs> involves this matrilineal family line. And um, my grandmother, who's 101 years old, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, um, she, you know, she's just been such an incredible force in my life. You know, she helped, like I said, my mother is a single mother and she really helped raise me um, and was always just very, very involved in my life. Um, and just a really sort of incredible, incredible woman with just like way ahead of her time always. And I just, I just value her a lot as a, as a human being aside from, from just being my grandmother. Um, so yeah, I wanted, I wanted to dedicate the book to her and she, I mean, she reads in Spanish. And so it was important for me that that dedication was in Spanish. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just lovely. That's just lovely. Well, everyone in the book wants a better life for their children, but how they go about it is so different. And there's a great line towards the end that Jeanette has scribbled into the book that has seen many generations. The book that we were talking about is passed down. We are more than who we say we are. And I feel that that's a great line for us to kind of wrap up because it is because everybody wants to be more than who we say we are. We always want to be able to be more. Am I on track with what we're saying, what you're saying there? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, and I think we all are probably more than the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Um, and that there's so much that no one has access to in us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think I, I wanted to, to capture some of that. Mm -hmm. I see this is going to be a book that's going to be talked about in book clubs. I see book clubs are going to want to chat with you. If they want to do that. Is there a way that they can reach out to you? And do you do that? Would you chat with book clubs? Um, I usually, you know, get those requests through like my publicist or my agent. Um, but I do have a website. It's uh, GabriellaGarciaWriter.com. Mm -hmm. And um, there's contact info there. And there's also like my social media handles there. So, yeah. I just see people wanting to chat with you just because it's just such an interesting book and you bring so much to light. Um, I'm hoping you write something else soon, even Me if it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> this has not been an easy year. This is not, I think, I don't think I, I don't think I know an author who said this was my most prolific year. I could just bang out the prose, you know, nobody's saying That's that. That's very comforting. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. I'm hearing that over and over again. And also, I have a lot of friends who, um, other friends who didn't publish last year and were very depressed that they didn't have a book come out. And I said, I think that went okay. <laughs> I think that was really all right. It's much better that it's this year. You know, this time last year, we were, of course, sort of like scrambling on what's going to be next. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have Zoom in place. <laughs> it's been hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, I look forward to crossing paths with you somewhere along the way at some book festival and congratulations again. It's a brilliant debut novel and I'm just wishing you all the best with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time.